We're going to start today's lesson uh, thinking a bit about the performance of the lambda calculus. Um, the statement that I want to make in this video is that the lambda calculus is slow and that we can improve uh, its performance. Of course, originally the intent of lambda calculus is not really to be executed. We are using it as a way to specify the execution or, or the, the central mechanism by which functional programming languages operate. But really, it, it's more about how you can do something rather than how you should implement something, right? It's more about a specification rather than an actual algorithm that you should implement it. We are implementing it, of course, in this course uh, for educational reasons, right? But as we will see next, um, this spec can be improved upon if you want to at least uh, make the performance a bit nicer in terms of time. So let's look at what we have. So we have the lambda calculus where we have expressions. They could be either primitive uh, num values, which are either numbers or lambdas. And then we have variables. And then we have um, function calls, right? So the semantics of this, of any functional programming language, can be um, defined in only two rules. So super simple, fits in a napkin. First one is if you have a value, values need not be evaluated. They are what they are, so you just return them. Um, if you have a function call, then you should evaluate the function first. That will return a lambda. And then you should evaluate the argument. That will return some value, uh, the evaluated value. And then what you do is you take the body of the lambda and you find and replace any x and replace x by v, right? The result of evaluating the argument. And then what you return is the result of evaluating all of this. So the result of evaluating the substituted body, right? So what that does, it returns eventually a value, let's call it vb, and that's what you should be returning. Okay? And now what I was trying to ask you is, what is the complexity of this operation, right? Because as we, we know, we need to evaluate all of this, evaluate E of F, E of A, and then we need to do this operation, right? And now I want you to think a bit about the complexity of this very subtle so find and replace, right? The problem with find and replace is that we have to, um, we have to go through find and replace every occurrence of a certain variable in the code. So if your code grows, so will the substitution, right? Because you have to literally, whenever you call a function, you have to find and replace, you have to rewrite the code, create a copy of that, the whole code. Even if it's one million lines of code, you have to copy that and then find and replace that code. Every occurrence of X, replace it by VA, right? So as you might imagine, as the code grows, so will uh, this step of your um, function call. So obviously this is not optimal. The, the runtime grows linearly on the size of the term, right, being replaced. So which in this case is E of B, the body of the function. So how can we do this better? How can we improve this idea? Well, we do what we usually do, which is we trade off um, a bit of time for memory. Or to put it another way, we're going to cache, right? We want to store in memory as much as we can so that we can improve the performance, reduce the time. So increase space, reduce time. Usual trade-off. So how do we do this? Well, one idea is to delay substitution until it's really necessary. So what we can do is rather than... Um, rather than performing the find and replace, when you have a, an, an expression, whatever you are evaluating, you always have an expression along with the environment, which is all the substitutions you want to make. And let's call these substitutions the bindings, right? What you have is you're going to, you're going to have basically a hash table, right, where the keys are the variables, and the values are going to be the values of the variables, right? So the bindings, what are you bound to that variable? Um, to that end, we're going to need to introduce, so environment is this hash table that I just mentioned, 
and in, so whenever you hear about environments, what I mean, well, usually I would say a map, I wouldn't say a hash table, but this is just so for those of you who are familiar with a hash table, um, more abstractly, I would refer to that as a map. So anything or a dictionary. So anything that has keys to values, uh, that would be the environment where the keys are variables, values are the values of those variables. We will also need to update our notion of closure. So the, the value, the runtime value of a function, right? As we will see. So these are the two things we need to do. So we're going to introduce a lookup table called the environment where we are going to, where we're going to bookkeep the variable bindings. And then we need to update how, uh, what is an ex what is a function value when it's evaluated dynamically. Okay. So now we, you see the little arrow here, right? So this arrow before we said it was a function that took an E returned a value. Now we're, our function takes two parameters. Not one, but two. First parameter is the expression. Second parameter is the environment, right? So all the bindings. We need to keep that along because we have not performed the substitutions in E. So we need to bring along what are the values of the various uh, variables. So we need two parameters. Um, okay, so now in homework four, by the way, this is just a heads up. Homework four, you're going to have a function eval is going to take an environment and an expression where the environment is going to be a hash table uh, where you, you use um, in the record manual is going to be hash. Confusingly, this is not hash code or food. This is really just a hash table. I think they kind of omitted the most important part here which is table. Uh, functions and structs begin with S. So we, we have to distinguish between, as you saw, um, we have S and E. S is for substitution, E is for environment, or S is for slow, E is for fast. Um, so in your code, you're going to have the two versions, right? You're going to have the version, the first version you've learned, which is lambda S with substitutions. And after that, you're going to have lambda E and we prefix uh, the AST separately so that there's no confusion, right? So you'll have one AST for lambda S and one AST for lambda E. You may ask, why do I need two ASTs if they are the same? Well, they're not. Why are they not the same? Well, they're not the same for two reasons. Because when you have a lambda, right? The lambda has to capture, the, the basic idea is that lambda now becomes an expression, something that needs runtime information to uh, get a meaning of, right? So when in this version, lambda E, what you have is, this is the declaration and this is the runtime value. And remember in the previous lesson where, we, where I introduced the notion of a closure, so you only have a notion of a closure uh, so a closure is really just an implementation detail. It's just telling you that when you implemented um, your pro favorite functional programming language, you need to bring along not just the code, but also the substitutions, right? The environment. So a number is a value. A closure is a value, right? And a closure pairs an environment with the code of that function. Okay. So now let's look at expressions again, a value. Okay. As it was a variable is an expression, not a value, right? This is as before and function application just as before, but now of course, Lambda is an expression. So it's going it, to, it's going to become something else, right? So a Lambda becomes a closure. So now let's look at the rules. Now we have two new rules. Value is the same. So if you have a value, just return that. If you have a variable, now there's a different thing, right? Before, variables wouldn't even show up in the rules. Why? Well, they wouldn't show up in the rules because whenever you needed a variable, you would replace it, right? So the only place where variables would appear would be in the as parameters. So when you instantiate, when you finally replace x by a value, by the argument, then that variable would disappear. So if you think about it, 
it's impossible to have any variable existing at runtime because you're always finding and replacing it. So therefore you have no variables at runtime, no dangling variables. However, in the Lambda E calculus, because you've delayed substitution, now you have variables. So now you have to do them, do something with them. What do you do? Well, the way you evaluate them is you look up in the environment, what is its value, right? So you look up in this hash table. So the key X is associated with what? That's what you return. Okay. Now we get to the closure rule. What the closure rule is saying is if you have a Lambda, you have to capture the environment at creation time. And this is really important. This is saying if you have, if you think about it, when you're programming in Racket, that's what I meant by it, the, the Lambda captures variables and all that, that I repeated when I talked about, when I introduced the notion of a, of a closure. And the idea is that when you write a Lambda, because it can access whatever variables are available in, in its scope upon creation time, right? Upon declaration time. Uh, so those are captured and they are captured here in this environment. So because we have the very, the, all the mappings between variables and values in E, whenever we create a Lambda, right, at runtime, whenever you evaluate this expression, it becomes the closure that holds all, you know, a snapshot of all the variables and what are the values of, associated with it, okay? And also the code, of course, you need to run it. So what do we do when we run it? Okay, so we have again, a function and an, and an argument, only one. What do we do? We evaluate a function, right? But now what is the runtime value of a function? It has to be a closure, right? It's no longer, because this, just a single lambda, that's an expression. And what does this, what does the evaluation return? It returns value. So it could either return an N or an, a closure. And we know that this is a function, so that therefore, E comma lambda is the runtime uh, value of a function, known as a closure. And then an argument is evaluated as before, but now notice something important. When we call a function, right, which is to say we want to, you know, evaluate the function, evaluate the body, the argument. Now what we need to do, we need to evaluate the body of the function right? As we did before, right? Let me show you. Here we evaluated the body, but we have to somehow represent this substitution. The whole point of this story was to delay substitution. So what do we do instead? Well, now because we take the environment that was used to create that function and we extend it by instantiating the parameter X with the value of A. Okay, and this is the crucial point. Okay, this is where things are interesting. So, so far here, nothing too different. But here, notice that we have to pass a different parameter. So, when you call, this is basically a conditional, right? Where you have four branches. In the branch of function application, you will evaluate the function first, then the argument. And then you take the value that resulted from evaluating the function. You have to take the environment stored in one place and then the code stored in another place. From that code, extract EB. Okay, you're gonna use you're gonna need to use the air R, sorry, S colon. I guess here is E colon lambda body and E colon lambda arguments and so on. So you're gonna use those as accessor functions to take out the components of these two things, right? To take out the EB, to take out the EB and to take out this X. So the X is here. When we call this third recursive call, we need to create a new hash table. And this is what it means. It means you take the old hash table E of B, capital E of B, and you add X to V. So you put on um, variable X value VA, that returns a new hash table. That's what you pass to the third ev evaluation of VB. And that represents substitution. Okay, so just to recap, when you're calling a function recursively with environments, you evaluate the function, that will return a closure. Then you evaluate the argument, that will return some value. And then what you do is you take the body of 
the function that you just evaluated. Then you take its environment, so you ignore whatever environment you're in, again, because of lexical scoping and all that. And then what you do is you extend the environment, so you create a new one that takes the old environment of the function and you replace x by a, therefore shadowing an old x. Suppose that eb contain an old x, that's why, that's why x is not present there, because in this rule we're stating that we are overriding it. Right, so now x becomes assigned to v. Okay, that's basically it. So now let's recap. Overview of lambda environments. Declaring function, declaring a function is now an expression that needs to be evaluated, right? What it returns is a function value, which is also known as a closure. A closure packs the environment at creation time with the original function declaration. And then calling a function unpacks the environment and the code, right, from the closure and then extends that environment with the parameter x being assigned to VA. That's basically it. And then if you are confused about the notation, here is some side notes explaining what everything means, particularly that uh, this empty set represents the empty environment with zero variable bindings. When you see E here, that means uh, in the hash table put or add operation where you're adding, a, assigning to a certain variable, a certain value. Whenever you see the notation E of X equals V, that means you're looking, you're doing a lookup on the hash table. Um, and in the next video, I'm going to cover something um, that is more to like a source of examples known as the church and churches encoding. coding.